Anyway, welcome back, church family, and those who are tuning in far and wide to our series called One, Abiding in Communion. That's why I'm wearing, I'm donning my one team shirt, right? Because we are one, one team, one fight. Well, not necessarily the army, but right against the powers of darkness to bring light and hope to this generation so that everyone will see Jesus. But, um, you know, we are doing this series because we're doing a cultural shift in our church because we want to give you a vision that group life, small group life, is not just a nice to have idea, but it's a need to have must, essential part of our Christian experience and growth. And it's not just our church idea. It is Jesus' master plan of growth and transformation so that the world could see that we are one. And it's like, why does the world need to see that we are one? Because it's by our oneness, it's by our love that the world can see that there is a real, for real kind God, right? We can talk all but truth and everything else, but it's the, our lives lived out as one with our love that people can say, man, I want what you have. I want what you have. And that's why we are saying, hey, we all need this. It's essential. And last week, if you were uh, not here, but if and you were here, you heard from our own Pastor Lori, who champions the cause of healing. Actually, it happens all throughout our church, but especially Monday nights when we have this hope uh, ministry where people come with hurts, habits, and hangups. And they go, man, I can't get over these. And she brings people together for a time of healing weekly, when people can pour into each other's lives. And she talked about the kind of community that would, in our moments of where we cannot walk to Jesus because we're limping or paralyzed spiritually, that you would take your turn to sit on the mat and that you would have, what kind of friends you would have? Math friends, yes, that those people will come along and carry you when you cannot carry yourself to Jesus. Not only that, but that when you get a little stronger, that you can take the turn on the mat as well to carry somebody else to Jesus when they need help as well. And that's what we are going to um, contend for in our church, to be that kind of community where we can find mat friends. But at the same time, um, I want to show you, speaking of mat friends, I want to show you Matt Kirk's Matt, Matt friends. This is a picture of Matt and Chastity Kirk with uh, the group that they brought together uh, a couple of Fridays ago. And they said, hey, let's become Matt friends together. And they met at their house in Waihoa. And there, there are others that I have offered to host as well. But uh, isn't it an amazing picture? They, they, they just met for the first time all in that configuration together. And uh, they already have a space problem. I'm not talking about Houston, we have a problem, space problem. They have a real space problem in terms of having people like, how are you going to have all these kids, there's Kiki in one place? Well, already they're talking about that. But the neat thing happened on that meet, and it was supposed to be just a meet and greet time. That's why they had name tags, everyone just getting to know each other and their kids' names and whose kids it goes with who, right? You know how that goes, right? And uh, as they were going around sharing and introducing one another, one of the couples uh, felt, felt real and vulnerable to share. You know what? We're going through an ordeal. We're going through a trial. And Matt, as the great leader, didn't say, oh, okay, we'll talk about that later. But no, they, they, they rallied around that couple and they prayed. Didn't you, Matt? Chastity? And they prayed for them. And it's like, oh, I'm so amazing. They had their agenda, but God had another. And they carried that couple to Jesus. And now that couple doesn't have to journey alone in their ordeal. They have others that are their mad friends. And I couldn't be there with them at that uh, evening because I had uh, a friend uh, and the wife. Uh, we were mad friends together in the same season of life. They, they're now missionaries in Thailand. I was at home, and we did a FaceTime video, and I introduced them to my lifetime mad friends when we had kids the same age as them. And he said, look, just a picture of what it could be like for you to have this amazing story of journeying life with others that carry you and you carry them in life. And so that's what happened a couple of um, Fridays ago. And you know, um, 
that group is so great, but not all the young families could meet on that evening. So you got to love Braden and Darcy uh, and Rosario's heart because said, you know, you couldn't make it that night, but let's get, get gathered together. So they gathered together with a couple other couples. And this is an amazing picture because um, they all have boys, <laughs> all boys and all the baby boys, these three little ones. Of course, he's older, but there was a time in church where they came to church, all hapai, right? All carrying. And we got, I, I, I had a picture. I couldn't find it. They're all praying together for their future as mothers, futures of having and raising boys. And they're connected as friends. And that's what we want to, you know, give you a picture of. We have math friends. We have people that we can do life together and, and, and just experience the goodness of God. And today, what I'll be talking about in this message that uh, I'll be giving is uh, I'm going to be speaking about the power of the poor. Can you say that? No, yeah, not power of the poor, like poor in spirit. The power of the poor. poor. I think, what is that? Pastor, poor, <laughs> power of the poor. Yeah. It's being in a setting where you can be poured into, not only by people, but, but from God. And as you've been poured into by God, right? He gives you so much downloading and everything else. You get filled up so that you can what? Pour into others. It's the power of the poor. And that's going to be talking about today. And that's what um, happens and can happen in our groups, in our church. Because that's where we pour into one another. And if you're involved in a group like that, you know what I'm talking about. It's like then times and you feel like, God, man, I... I need to be poured into. And God, I, I know I can get poured into by you, but sometimes we have others that pour into us, God uses. Or you see or somebody in need and you say, you know what, can I pour myself into you? And that's what I'm going to be talking about, that kind of commu uh, community where growth happens and, and, and we can be for fellow pourers for Christ in each other. And you'll get to hear later on in our church. I, I, I can talk all day about this. But I'll give space because later on in church, you'll hear uh, stories of several people that have been transformed because God has poured into their life and they have had the chance to pour into others. Another couple, they, they've been so dry, spiritual dry, but God used the group to pour into them. And now they get to be uh, an example to others. You're going to hear about later. But now I want you to now take this moment to reflect upon your life. And think through who has poured into your life to help you become the person you are today. And you can say, oh, of course, mom and dad. Sure, mom and dad poured into your life. But I'm talking about beyond them. Who has believed in you when maybe you yourself or others didn't believe in you? Who looked past your failures and kept having faith in you even if you have failed them or failed yourself, but they said, you know what? I'm, I'm still going to believe in you. Who gave you a chance when somebody didn't and saw potential for you for the future? Do you have somebody like that in your life or some people like that in your life? Do you? Yeah. Reflect on that. Would you say that? that? That's me. I have had people there. Would you raise your hand? Really? That's it? The rest? No? If you think hard enough, right? People have poured into your life, and for much of who you are today, it's because they saw potential in you. They said, you know what? I'm going to com com uh, commit myself. I'm going to invest my time in you. I'll just share some of my people in my life that God has used, you know, as a person growing up and committing my life to baseball. That was my life. I made the high school team, and uh, my coach said, Earl, I want you to be one of the captains. I said, really? Me? You think people can follow me as a captain? And uh, he said, no, no, don't worry. I can see potential in you. And he, I was one of the captains. And I'm thinking back, I'm so glad that that coach saw something in me because today I get to coach people in life, you know, in a different way. And then I wanted to um, become a teacher. Why? Because I wanted to coach baseball the next level. So I said, I'm going to become a teacher. So I said, I'm going to become a PE teacher. And my high school teacher told me, Earl, how come you like B1 
a PE teacher, only get one PE teacher per high school. Hard, you know. I said, yeah, I know, but I, I don't know what else kind of teacher for be. He said, why don't I help you be one English teacher? <laughs> English? Eng English? That's not my first language like that, you know. For real kind, he said, I'll help you, Earl. I'll help you. And I became an English teacher because he believed in me. Well, fast forward a little later. Um, now I have a son now. Now I'm teaching English after Japan. I come back and I'm thinking about going back to Japan. But anyway, I'm teaching at a language school in Honolulu. And my son is in baseball. But the, the school Paul 4.30. I'm in traffic, driving home, changing in the car. You know what I mean? I can barely get to practice, let alone not crashing. And I said, God, I gotta change careers. I wanna coach my son. Well, I'm so glad that there was this young, spry, promising pastor in Mililani that said, Earl, could you join us and be a part of our team? And he took a chance on me 23 years ago. This Tantanan guy, I think he knew everything to be a pastor. He said, I'll go take care of the weekend service, but can you take care of all the other stuff, community? I said, it shoots, Pastor. I'm going to do that, and I'm here today. God used all those people in my life, and I'm thinking just your life. God has used people to where you are today. Do you know that Jesus himself took a chance and saw potential in those he poured his life into? The guys that Jesus chose were not like superstar people, no. Do you know that? For many of them, they were what? Fishermen. And they weren't even fishermen like me who catch the kind of shibis from the boat. You know what I mean? They, they're, throwing, they're throwing the nets and catching this kind of smoke. Manini, not manini, but you know, tilapia. Manini, tilapia. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and then maybe you have a tax collector, right? Nobody liked him. And these other guys, no, no, we're not even aware. We did not even mention what they were. They were just regular Joes, right? Regular, I don't know, Sarah's, Laurie's, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Regulars. But Jesus had a vision for these people that would become world changers. He chose them. And he said, you know, I, you, you may not see yourself as a world changer, but I do. And he recruited them not to stay from afar, but he said, I'm going to recruit you to come up close and personal. And in those three years that he recruited them to come close to be his constant companions. He deposited, Jesus poured his life into these 12. Because he knew that in these three short years, they would be the ones that needed to embody his very teachings, his very life. Not just the truth, his life, so that they would become people who would carry that value on for the world to see. So that's why this, this morning, I want to give you another picture. We have Matt friends. I want to give you a, 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 another picture of how Jesus poured his life into people so that the world changed. And I, I want you to look at Jesus' early setting where he poured his life into his uh, fellow believers. Right now, fellow, but his, his, his faithful followers. And Jesus started out his first year of ministry in this one location in Israel. Do you know where that area was? It was where? Anyone? Huh? Galilee. Galilee. Ha have, has anyone been to Galilee? Raise your hand. Israel? Some of you have, right? Yeah. So I have, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of this Galilean area. I think, oh, when was it? Like 2007? But I still look the same, I think, you know? Good church. <laughs> That's me and my giant of a friend, 6'5 guy. But something Bobby, like your height, you know, I'm with him. We over, we're overlooking the Sea of Galilee, right? Uh, from the Mount Arbel. It's overlooking the Sea of Galilee. But interesting, we call it the Sea of Galilee because is the Sea of Galilee a real sea? No. no. It's not a sea. It's a what? It's a lake. It's like 13 miles from north to south and seven miles long. So it's kind of hard. You can cross it by swimming, right? You need a boat, right? You need a boat. Bobby, not a big kind of boat, but you know, you need a boat. You know what I mean? And that's where Jesus did much of his ministry. 
And he d did it in that Galilean area around these towns, uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and um, yeah, just all in this area. And I want you to hear about maybe just how he spent that time, because we're going to be talking about the setting, the setting where Jesus brought his 12 together. You guys ready? But instead of having you read it, I'd like you watch this scene. Okay? You guys ready? Yeah. You guys ready for watch? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, you're going to understand. So watch them. <laughs> Jesus teach the people with plenty of stories like that. He only tell them stuff they can understand. He never teach them out of stuff, only with stories. But every time he stay only with the guys he stay teach, he tell them what the stories mean. That time, after the sun go down, Jesus tell his guys, Hey, we go to the other side of the lake. They leave all the people, and Jesus guys take him inside the boat. At other boats there too. Then get one big storm over there. The waves they're bossing over the boat, and the boat almost fully. But Jesus still yet stay sleep in the back on one pillow. His guys go wake him up and tell him, Hey, teacher, you know Kira's going mucky or what? Get out and scold the wind in the waves. You tell, quiet, come calm. Then the wind died down and the water come calm. And he tell these guys, how come you guys scared? You know, trust me or what? They're so scared. They tell each other, Hey, what kind of guy is? Even the wind and the waves do what he tell them for do. Ho, 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 You guys get them. Oh, do you understand? <laughs> oh, sorry, some of you don't understand pigeon. Oh, that's my first language like that. So, you know, anyway. It was only in those moments where Jesus was with his 12 that he gets to teach these important life lessons, right? Just like we sang this morning, right? Just the storms can come, right? The winds can come. But I am with you. Remember that. He used object lessons up close and personal with his disciples. And I want you now to read. Yeah, really. I'm going to have us read. And as we read, I want you to focus on the setting now of where Jesus did much of his teachings and imparted his life or poured his life into these uh, 12. And so I want you to read with me and just go, aha, aha, I get it now, where the setting was. You guys ready? Okay, let's read. Ready, go. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to get some rest, right? So you see, all it pulled them away from the crowd. Okay, now we'll continue reading. So they went away by themselves, where? In a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Because he, uh, he didn't want to chase the crowd away. They were coming, so he taught them, right? So let's continue. Ready, go. The number of men who had eaten f was 5,000. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples, what? Get in the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up to the mountains to pray, right? Told them, he told them, you do what? Get in the boat, right? And of course... Did he, did he ditch them? Did he say, you know what? I want to be by myself. He went up to the mountain to pray. Why? He wanted to spend time with whom? His father, his heavenly father. 
He wanted to get poured into, right? He was just tired. He'd, he was a part of all the crowds, right? And now he was going to be imparting more of wisdom. Of course, he's God, but, you know, he, he needed that time to model for us, right? To spend time with his Heavenly Father. And he's down, getting downloaded by him take, going to solitude. Let's continue reading. Later that night, ready, go? The boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw his disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. Okay? He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, what? Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were harden now just just think about that the picture right of, of what is happening there you see that picture there it is uh jesus in the boat with his disciples and the boat is like you know yay big 12 of them and jesus saying you guys you know like whoa scared hey and he commands the wind the waves to calm down and they're a part of that and you know that's a picture i want you to see that we all need, as I call them, boat buddies. <laughs> Tell the person next to you, you need a boat buddy. <laughs> you need a boat buddy. You, right? I mean, I, I, Jesus, taught, because they, they, they were in Galilee, they were crossing the, 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 the lake or crossing the, we're in the sea, and they were going and Jesus wanted to do his best work in helping them see that I am with you through the storms of life. I'm going to be there with you. And I believe it's a picture for us today that Jesus wants to get into your boats, get into the relationships that you, you, you have. And you know, say, I want to be there. I'm not going to leave you on your own. I'm going to be there. I may be sleeping on the pillow and you guys all freaking out, but I'm, I'm still with you. Does that make sense? to show you that I've never left you. I'm always there for you. You see, so much can only be caught from afar. And the crowds come and go, right? Even weekend services, crowds come and go. But Jesus came for community. Jesus taught the crowds from afar, but connected deeply in community in close proximity. And much of this happens in the setting of Jesus with his disciples in the boat, in community. We need boat buddies. And if this, that is how Jesus modeled life in community, to have his followers, I want to model my life after the master himself. Don't you? He didn't isolate himself, right? Instead, he retreated in, to get poured into from his heavenly father. And then he said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to get back in the boat with my buddies. They need my presence. They're always scared. No more courage. I'm going to be in the boat with them to remind them I'm always there. And we can learn from each other. I want to share with you a picture that as you leave today, you, you will leave. If you can remember anything that you can remember, this illustration and I'm going to show you this illustration, but that I hope that this will illustrate well the idea of you being poured into, and you pouring into others. So can I ask the usher guys to come forward and bring up the stuff? You see, God, when Jesus spent time with his heavenly father, he was downloaded so much of, of the father's reminder to him of his mission, he downloaded to him the promises of investing in these ordinary joes. Don't forget these guys you've chosen. I see potential. You see potential in them as well. And so God pours himself. Can I ask my boat buddies and can I ask God to come on stage? <laughs> you see, our lives are represented by these items. What are these? And what's the purpose of a sponge? Wash clothes. Come on. What is the purpose of a sponge? 
Soak up water? If you said soak up water, is that the purpose? Well, that's one purpose of the sponge. They can see you over there, yeah? One purpose of the sponge is to soak up water. But if it's just to soak up water, it's not really accomplishing its purpose. Because it can soak up water, but what is its purpose as it's soaked up? It's to what? Be wrung out. out. Wrung out. And as we choose to be sponges, we choose to open our lives to Jesus and be open as sponges. God can download his very presence, his very promises, his very reminders who we are in an identity. And we get filled up. We get filled up. We get filled up so much so that we are in a position to what? Pour out into others. We get to be poured out into others. And as we pour out into others, God is still pouring himself out in so many different people, right? So many people around us he's pouring into. And as I get wrung out, as I get wrung out, because I've wrung out myself in Mark and Kai, what happens? They can help by pouring back into me, right? You can pour them back in and I get to pour back into Mark and Kai. Right, you need to be pouring out more, guy, man. Shots, man. Shots, man. A little more, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Bro, bro, bro. And, 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 bro. Mark, let's pour out to Mark. Uh, let's again. But God continues to pour out in all of us, doesn't he? And you know what? We cannot just be full, full. You know, we cannot be full. God, thank you. Fill me up, fill me up. Oh, so much, so good, so good, so good. And you just keep yourself, right? I mean, sometimes we get so full up with experiences, his promises, and we have so much skill, talent, and abilities, and we just don't get to do what God wants to do, to empty ourselves, to wring ourselves out so that others can be full full and when others are full and they get to right do life together they get to um they get to pour into the next generation of people (laughs) right they get to pour in the next generation of people right so they're there they're there and they're they're just going for it they're going for it (laughs) i need some too you know (laughs) yes yeah 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 yeah. i need some too and 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 it's a story and maybe their their sponges are small right now (laughs) But as they grow in faithfulness, God will replace them, give them more capacity, take more of himself, right? Right, right. And they can do that for the next and next generations. And that's what we need to do because God's ever-flowing presence and power will continue to flow within us. God, we need more of your presence, your power. Come on. Come on. Thank you. We're pouring into each other. Can you say thank you to my bow buddies and the next generation? God, you're kind of slow, God. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, uh, some of us can be more like what? Bricks. Yeah, we sad to have brick buddies, right? Shucks, because God wants to pour his very power, his presence into our lives. And, you know, as much as God wants to pour out, his, his pouring out just falls. It's lost. It's ne- never absorbed. Just these great promises, great uh, reminders who we are. It just falls through, right? And we think God can use us, but, man, we're just breaking people. You know what I mean? We are so what? Hard. hard. Bible talks about hard, hearted, and hard. And we say in Hawaii, hard head. head. You got hard head. <laughs> God, fill me up and fill me up now. <laughs> Hurry up, God. Do me my way. Bro, you're splashing over the place, God. <laughs> but you, and God will say, you hard-headed. How can I pour my, why do I waste my flowing on your life? Because you're so hardened. I want you to replace and have a heart of a sponge so that you can soak in my very presence. I want you to be a sponge. Amen. So that you can pour your life, bring it out before others. I need you to be that kind of person so you can pour my very presence to others around. They need me through you. Thank you, God. All right. (laughs) What I want to do right now, 
I have enough talking already. I want you to hear from this one person. You, you see her in church, you see her serving, you go, wow, she, she came um, already made. Hmm? But you hear from her. You hear from how she was. But she, when she put herself in a situation to be poured into, life happened for her. And didn't stop with her because she chose to pour herself in others. Would you help me welcome and hear this story of amazing power of the poor through Natalie Gamboa as he comes and shares. Now, it is so much of my joy to introduce Natalie to share. Why? Because um, her mom and dad are my high school classmates. Not only that, her mom was on our baseball team. Well, she wasn't a player. She was a statistician. And she was on our team, so I got to know her mom, Shelby, and uh, her dad, Benji. And uh, I go um, fishing with her brother. So would you just help me welcome up Natalie Gamboa as she shares her life. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Natalie. <laughs> I'm the youngest of three, and I come from a family of divorced parents. My dad took me and my siblings to this church back when they were at Mililani Ike, when we were younger, and I loved going to Children's Ark. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I got baptized. As I reached middle school, I started my years of rebellion. My parents divorced when I was five, so I didn't really understand what was happening. But about fifth grade, I remember all these emotions just flooding me. My parents both had new partners, so I started to fill with anger. All I wanted was for my parents to get back together, and it didn't happen. So I felt angry with God, and I ended up walking away. For then up until last year was a very dark time in my life. Between those years, I hit rock bottom. I had suicidal thoughts and I developed some social anxiety. In that time, I dealt with a really toxic relationship that took a toll on me mentally, physically, and emotionally. I was in and out of friend groups, being the outcast, ignored, betrayed, disappointed, taken advantage of. I was filled with anger, jealousy, resentment, and loneliness. Even in a crowded room, I just felt so alone. The lies consumed me that I was being punished by God and that I had no purpose and no one liked me. I started to seek attention from the wrong people. Eventually, it came to a point that I concluded this is what my life was gonna be and became comfortable. This all changed last November. My sister started coming back to church and started to encourage me to do the same. This was the first of many people in my life to help pick me up. I mean, she's always the first person. The next person was Pastor Earl. After service, I asked for prayer and he prayed and spoke as if God were speaking through him, which it was. From there, my circle kept growing. I started to meet new people at church. I joined the hula ministry, the worship team youth, and I was introduced to Kanoi, um, Pastor Earl's daughter. Sorry, he made me say that. <laughs> <laughs> Who invited me into her small group at UH West Oahu. I was able to feel vulnerable and that people actually cared. No one judged me or condemned me. They just welcomed me with open arms. My life was so dark and all these people brought light into me. Every person in ministry that I mentioned has lifted me up spiritually. Of course, I know that God is within me, and I always seek God first before anyone else, but we shouldn't neglect the importance of community. I longed for an authentic group, or at least just one person in my life. For me, that person was you, Kanoi. I just feel so safe with her. In my small group at school, I was able to learn how to pray with others, do devotionals and talk about it ask questions and openly share without feeling ashamed. We were, were able to hold one another accountable, not only for the times that we stumble, but also to celebrate the good things God has done in our lives. I started to come around to Youth Night and became one of the leaders. I helped to co-lead the high school girls. 
I was able to share my testimony last week and it inspired Kira, in, who is in my small group, to share her testimony last week. That touched my heart to know that I have an impact on people like that. Being older doesn't make me any more spiritually matured, but I get to share what I learn and I get to learn from them in return. I'm still new to all this, but I can really feel God moving and that this is where I'm supposed to be. I have the opportunity to be on both sides, to be discipled and to disciple. I think this is so important as I get spiritually poured into, I get to pour into others. And I was telling the other services that I promised Pastor Earl never told me to say that. <laughs> it was just perfect that this was um, the message. I was driving the other day and was thinking about how God is so funny sometimes. I had social anxiety, so talking in front of a big crowd was a big no-no for me. But he led me to hula and worship to perform, joined the youth to teach, and now I'm standing here and I get to testify how powerful our God is and his people are. This community has healed someone who has broken basically all her life in just a few months. So thank you, and I give all the praise and glory to him. So what happens, crazy stuff happens, that you like that, people act like that and just be real. I mean, it's so fun. Oh, why are you crying, Kanoi? You make like that. Yeah. You know, Natalie drew this for me. I'm so blessed, Natalie. I'm just waiting for, for me to catch a real big one so you can do gyotaku for me, right? <laughs> Can you say thank you to Natalie as he shares? Yeah, thank you. That's just one story of how God transformed her, the power of the poor, by coming out of her comfort zone, getting connected in community. And now she gets to do the same, making a difference in the next generation for a church, right? Well, I want to introduce you to uh, a couple who are in my boat. We're boat buddies. So glad they're with us. So I want you to help uh, me welcome up my boat buddies, uh, Russell and Trong Malone, as they share their story of transformation and growth. Now, um, uh, Russell and Trong. I, I got to show this picture. I got to show this picture. Uh, but yeah, this is when they kind of first... Come, come up, come up, come up. Trang, was that yesterday? <laughs> yeah, not from Russell. But they met. They met uh, in the army. And small story, long story short, uh, they were both chosen to represent the army on the volley, army volleyball team. And so Russell came to Hawaii and everything else, and he, he found out there was going to be a new uh, person that joins the team. And, and uh, he saw the name, Trong, you know, and he said, oh, Trong Win, I want to meet this guy. You know, he doesn't know about <laughs> Vietnamese name, right? Well, he saw her, and it, it was love at first spike. <laughs> you, you understand? So the mom can explain to you. <laughs> It was, wasn't it, Russell? You told me. You're right, you're right. But it wasn't all rosy and everything else. Tell me how life was when you first, uh, just coming out to church. Drunk, can you start? Sure. Yeah, so on the outside, uh, my life was dress right dress. So for you folks in the military, you may understand that. You know, 28 years in the military is a long time. You just go on with life. Um, maybe not living, but you know, on the inside, I was a hot mess. I was stuck, we were stuck, I was tired, beat down, angry, constantly disappointed, and every day I struggled with finding hope in my relationship with God, with Russell, and our marriage. My priorities were upside down. Um, we lived in the same house under the same roof, but we weren't even good roommates. Um, 
you know, there was many points I thought it was better for us to separate than put our children through everything that they had to endure in our house. We were stuck in that hamster wheel of blame and unforgiveness, and we couldn't find our way out. Um, you're not giving me what I want, so why should I give you what you want? You know, it's your fault. Round and round we went nowhere, just spinning around in circles. Um, I was completely dizzy and out of balance. Wow, we, didn't, we couldn't see it, right, just from afar? Russell, could you share just your perspective how things were? Sorry. Um, well, individually, <clears throat> I was angry all the time. Um, I was angry about our relationship and the, the lack of affection. Because in my mind, I was treating Trong well and, you know, like I loved her, but I really wasn't. I blamed her for everything. And everyone that's talked to us and prayed for us and helped us, they know this. I, I blamed her for everything. And I truly believed it was her fault. I couldn't see the problems that I was causing and that I was actually pushing her away from me. We only talked about things that needed to be done or that it, you know, involved the kids. We were roommates and that was it. Well, as you shared, you could have gone the divorce route because it just w wasn't working out, but you didn't. And you took the step in getting involved in a boat with other people that were transforming and growing. Can you share how that experience was? Yeah, so, so many of our church Ohana came and supported us. Um, we attended Inner Healing and Deliverance, Resolution for Men and Women, and we became involved in our Ohana group. So our brothers and sisters in Christ were there for us when we were at our lowest. Although, you know, everyone was going through their own struggles, they were there when we needed them. I texted them, I called 911 and asked for prayers. So. My OG queens and kings were there for us to listen, and they really helped teach me to focus on what the priority really was. It was me and my personal walk with God. How about for you? Thank you so much, Trung. I mean, yeah, there were kings and queens. We need those people in our lives, don't we? Well, even before we became a part of the Ohana group, um, the Church of Ohana was there for us, uh, along with my cousins, Bob and Leanne. Uh, they all reached out to talk and pray. Uh, when we joined the Ohana group, things just kind of took off. It was like it was an overdrive. Our Ohana group has been there for us so many times, listening, advising, and praying, standing in the gap for us to keep Satan away. Wow. You know, had you not been involved in taking that step to be in the boat and being coming vulnerable and real with what you had been going through, how would things be like? Um, well, if it wasn't for our Ohana group, I don't believe Trong and I would be here today. I don't believe we'd be together. Uh, the love of Jesus is so evident in our Ohana group. And even though I will always believe, I, I don't think I would have experienced so much of God's love, forgiveness, and grace without joining the Ohana group. Yeah, and I agree with Russell. I wouldn't be standing here today um, still married and now committed to God and our marriage without the support of our Ohana group. I've learned how to open up and be vulnerable and have a relationship with Jesus, um, even pray with Russell, even though it's uncomfortable for me. And we discuss topics that we've never brought up before um, in our almost 20 years of marriage. I've learned how to forgive I have hope, and I've learned how to start building trust again. And I don't go to that depreciation, negative thinking room as often anymore. Um, there's such a huge weight lifted from my soul, and I no longer feel like a hot mess on the inside. Next question. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's like, just continue talking, you know? You know, there are people here. They're hearing what the Lord says. He modeled having a setting to have boat buddies and mat friends and being poured into, being poured out. But, you know, somebody are here, maybe they don't have a situation like that, a setting like that. What would you, would you say to these people to say, you know what, they got to take that next step of faith? Yeah, so even if you're in a good place and life is treating you well, whether you're married or single, young or old, uh, we all need each other in community. 
So not only the dif during the difficult seasons, but all the time. So it may be uncomfortable at first um, to take that step of faith, but it can be life-changing. You know, it was for us. Um, so we always need community and others to support us spiritually in helping us grow in our relationship with God. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to be hurting. Your marriage doesn't have to be in trouble to benefit from Ohana Group. Um, we as Christians were designed and made for fellowship and community. And even if you think you might not benefit from a, attending an Ohana Group, maybe that's not the point. Um, maybe God will use, sorry, will use you to help someone else as all our Ohana Group has done for us. You can be a blessing on someone else's life without even knowing it. That's the power of our God. Wow. Can you say thank you to Russell and Trump? <sighs> you know, it would be amiss if I would say, okay, let's sing a song and let's just leave, right? It's like, what? You know, you have heard amazing stories of what God can do transforming and growing because they've been in a setting to be poured into and now they get to pour into others. You just can go and you're like, oh, that's nice. That was a nice, good feeling message, but so that'd be all sad. And I want us to take this time to respond. And I want you to respond in one way this morning because uh, I'm going to have you respond and get your pulse. Because if you don't respond, don't have a pulse, that means you what? dead. you probably hard, hardened, right? I want to give you a chance to respond. So right now, uh, ushers, can you come forward? And um, we have a physical pastoral pulse card that we want to pass out to those of you who don't have smartphones because we have an e-form that you can fill out. So if you have uh, your phones, you can take uh, a picture of the QR code and you can respond online. Or if you need uh, to respond in person because you don't have that feature uh, or that device, would you raise your hands or uh, ushers will come by with this physical uh, pastoral uh, pulse response card. So would you raise your hand as you go back and you need one? And when you fill this out, of course, those of you who are phys physically filling it out, don't just leave with it. Give it back to one of the ushers, okay? And I, I, I cannot force you to, to respond, but... <laughs> I want you to respond to the Lord in one way or the other. Because this, this value of ours can't just be for the elite people who want to grow. It's for everyone to grow, to be a part of a boat, a part of a mat where you have friends that can journey with you in life and pour into you as you pour into others. I don't take the time to respond. And the pastor and the rest of the church will, uh, leaders will look at this and will take this to heart because we're going to make this culture that everyone who wants to grow will be in a group, never left alone. And Russell and Chang, do we have more... Um, uh, seats in our boat together. It's more space. Plenty. Plenty, right? And in our um, boat, we eat good. <laughs> we eat good. It's sometimes my best meal of the week. It's supposed to be two people bringing, but you know how local Hawaiian style, two people bring, but it ends up everyone brings. Everyone gets filled. There's a group out there like that, a community of believers just waiting for you to say, I want to be in the boat with you. Let's do life together. Let's pour into one another as God pours his very presence to us. Don't be a brick. Be a sponge. Be ringed out. Because God has been so good to you, you can be good to others. So as you fill that out right now, online and everything else, I just pray that God will move in your hearts. Even online, as you're taking this in, you may be thinking, I'm, I'm an online congregant. Well, we'll figure out how to connect you to meaningfully involved. But would you stand right now as we close? <laughs>
call the worship team back on. I think God is calling all of us from the crowd into a community. Maybe you've been in the crowd for a long time, but it, I think now the Lord is pulling on your hearts to say, enough being in a crowd. Get into community. Get into the boat with others. He's done so much in all of our lives. Let's do it together. Right? Because what? We are more better together. Anyway, right? So let me pray and let's respond to the Lord. Dear Father God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I've heard some very, very compelling stories of people that have been touched by your very presence. Because Lord, they've not only been poured into by you, but Lord, by others as well that have invested and poured into them wrung themselves up into their lives so that they can be healed and whole again and now having the opportunity to make a difference in others. Thank you for these stories of transformation, God, that this is real happening today. God, I want that story to be my story as well. But God, it requires me to posture my life as a sponge. So church family right now, as an act of faith, would you just raise your hands up in the air as if you're saying, God, download your very presence, your very promises. Download your new identity for who I am. Go ahead, church. Would you do that? Open your lives for God to continue to, to pour his very power into your life. God, you see that right now. Your church, your bride opening up their lives to you saying god continue to fill me continue to fill me so much to overflowing that god help us now to take this next step of faith and and as every one of you are having their hands in the air would you now put your hands together as if you are now ringing yourself ringing yourself go ahead ring yourself over those that he has placed in you or some future people that he's asking you to, to ring yourself over and into. Would you do that right now? Would you do that? Would you do that? I don't know how to do that. Wow. I'm going to lead you and guide you. Just trust me. I'm going to help you do that. Like, I don't know who to do that with, but take the step of faith. Just be open. Don't be a brick. You don't know all the things that you, you know. Just be open. For me to speak and I'll speak and guide. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you so much that we have this moment to respond to you. And if there's anyone here that has never said yes to you, God, this is their moment that they need to open up them, themselves up to you, Jesus. Because it starts with saying yes to you, Jesus. Anyone online as well, saying yes to you, Jesus. Because when they open their lives to you, you decide to come into our very lives with your very presence. And when we do that, that's when we can, can tell others that we are your followers, Christians, Christ-like. That's what it means to be a Christian. God, I thank you. And if that's somebody like you today, we want to welcome you into the family. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for never giving up on us, always being open to pouring yourself into our lives, having, Lord, faith that we are all your children. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we all say, Amen. 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 Would you give Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, a great hand?